So I want to introduce you um, and then we can get started. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So Dr. Sa Sam Manger is uh, here from uh, with from us, oh gosh, let me try again. Dr. Sam Manger is here from James Cook University College of Medicine and Dentistry, where he's a general practitioner with a focus on lifestyle medicine and mental health. And he is the academic lead in senior lecturer at, of the postgraduate suite, which is basically the master graduate diploma and graduate certificate uh, arm of the lifestyle medicine um, uh, educational piece at the university. He's the immediate past president of the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and he is an ambassador for Equally Well Australia, uh, advisory group member of Shaping a Healthy Australia Project, and hosts the GP Show podcast for health professionals. Uh, and he has been a keynote speaker many places and written many publications, which I will ask him to share with us after this meeting so that we can also get catch up and get up to speed with what they're doing in Australia. I'm so excited that he uh, agreed to join us here today, Sam, please. Well, thanks, uh, Gia, for the um, introduction and the invitation. It is a yeah, great honor to be uh, here today. I'm just talking, I'm in my clinic at the moment, so if there's noise in the background, that's why. So I apologize about that and that's why I was a little bit uh, late today. Uh -huh. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of these slides. I won't uh, obviously go through the introduction and um, just a few declarations. So I, the, the Australian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which is sort of the equivalent of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, is that's a pro bono role. I'm the past president. I'm now the vice president and the podcast is pro bono as well. Obviously, I'm employed as a GP, a, a family physician and um, at JCU as well. So I'm going to talk about what is lifestyle medicine, but I know that this is possibly people who are already kind of aware of this. So I'm going to, there, there's certain things I'm going to go over a bit quicker and then some things I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, I've got quite a lot of slides, so I just always put this stop reality check. This is a little bit of a brain workout, this uh, lecture. Yeah, I've got 45 minutes and I'm going to make the most of every single second. Uh, so good thing it's recorded, so you can listen back if needed. And also just, I suppose, the reality check is that I like to, you know, make it clear that I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a um, neuroscientist, though I work with a lot of them and I've done a lot of work with them. Um, so, you know, I'm a family physician. I see this as sort of from a whole of person, whole of community point of view, a lot of what I do. And I also talk about what I think mechanisms, which I've found when I'm talking to patients and communities, what are the things that sort of sink in? So at the end of the day, there's a lot of information. It's a huge field, lifestyle psychiatry, and I'm going to try and condense it for you. So naturally, I will be neglecting certain things um, consciously. Um, so what is lifestyle medicine? Well, lifestyle medicine is the, the, the medicine of the way we live our lives. So how we live our lives can either heal us or harm us. Uh, that includes mind-body practices like meditation, breath work, uh, mindfulness, uh, and there are many other practices within that. It's a fascinating field in and of itself. Nutrition and diet, uh, and there's an emerging area called nutritional psychiatry, and there's an international uh, organization there now, uh, which was, I believe, set up by Professor Felice Jacker, now uh, headed by Dr. Wolfgang Marx. Um, physical activity and, and how we move, sleep quality and quantity, reducing harmful substances. And within that is screens as well, because we're seeing a lot of potential concerns arise from uh, overuse of screen time, pathological screen use and connection, social connection, social prescribing and connection with the natural world. So they're the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And some people add a few other things onto there, like health equity and environmental things, and that's fine. But we really focus on those six main pillars. And then we've got what they call the drivers of lifestyle medicine. So they're the things that take those pillars and put them into action, put them into impl implementation. And so it's the behavior change approaches, the health coaching is crucially important, behavioral science and using that, whether it's in informing how we de design our services, how we design our built environments and those modifiable aspects, <clears throat> the models of care and the services within that. And I'm going to cover a bunch of concepts that are used in Australia, New Zealand, um, UK and so on. Um, but I've no doubt in America that, you know, the funding models are a little bit different. The, the, the uh, delivery models are a little bit different. So acknowledging there's unique differences between countries. So take uh, what I say with um, some context. And clearly the digital aspect as well and the research component as well. There's a, we have some good research. In the last five to six years, we've had a, sort of really a rebirthing of this area of lifestyle psychiatry with some of the early randomized control trials. And I'll go through those with you. 
But the truth is we have a lot more. We have a lot more research that is required. We have a lot longer to go. You know, we have some evidence for depression, anxiety, and psychological stress more broadly. We are now, I think, the first randomized control trials for schizophrenia and severe mental illness, psychotic disorders are coming out or starting this year. And we, we, we're leading some of those at James Cook University. Um, but we have a, a, we have a lot of work to do. So, so this is an area of much interest, of much potential, and um, actually philanthropy of all the funders are probably the most interested in this because of you, either their lived experience of family members or whomever with mental illness, and they're looking for other ways of managing their distress and improving their recovery. So what lifestyle medicine is not, these are, these are the things that have popped up to me over the years, so I thought I'd just sort of you know, shoot it early. Um, so alternative medicine, I guess the important point here is this, this is not me criticizing natural medicine or anything like that. This is not me being negative. I'm simply saying what lifestyle medicine is not. Lifestyle medicine is evidence-based, foundational, common sense, mainstream, first line medicine. Um, is it herbs, oil, supplements, homeopathy? No, not really. It's none of those things. Um, again, if there are certain food products, like if you take saffron, for example, which has quite a few randomized control trials in depression, uh, showing some benefit and it to be safe with other anti-psychotropic medication. But um, so, you know, that's a, is, where does it where does it go? Is, it, is saffron a food? Yes. Is it a supplement? Yes. You know, you know that gets where it gets a little bit gray. Um, but none. The, but, you know, taking that into context, generally, we're not talking about uh, those alternative medicines. Is it medicine for wealthy people? And this is one of the things that I think is the nails on the chalkboard to me, the one that really grates me the most out of all of these comments I hear about lifestyle medicine. It's absolutely not. I mean, I've worked in um, psychiatric units for probably about seven years, and as well as as as, as well as being a GP for about uh, fourteen years. And I work with a lot of I bulk bill, which in Australia means we. Um, People don't get charged. They, they get it gets on the government scheme. So it's about ninety percent of my patients are bulk billed, and uh, so I see a lot of people who are in the lower socioeconomic groups uh, in society. People with uh, chronic psych schizophrenia, often homeless or itinerant. And and I've, I've provided lifestyle medicine programs in psychiatric wards, in community programs, in all different settings where the vast majority of people are absolutely not wealthy. Uh, they do not have access to resources. They do not have a lot of money. And I find it quite offensive to say that it's lifestyle medicine is only for wealthy people because this is actually the population cohort who benefit enormously. The evidence is quite clear that they want it um, as much, if not more, than the average population, and they engage just as well on average. And of course, there are exceptions to that, um, and there's nuance, the clinical nuance to all of that. But I suppose the point is, is that this is lifestyle medicine is about providing the best available care, full stop. It doesn't matter who the recipient is. It's also not one size fits all. And this is, I suppose, a big debate when it comes to nutrition. People say, no, there is one size fits all. I, I would say that there's not. I'm, I'm more on the personalized side of things, uh, partly because of clinical and cultural context. You know, I've got Aboriginal patients who would want to eat one way and I'll have other patients who want to go on another way. And my job is to be competent in all these different ways. But moving on from nutrition, I would say that there's no one movement that fits all. There's no one mind-body practice that fits all people. There's no one. So, so some people are much more responsive to mindfulness. Some people are much more responsive to physical relaxation, progressive muscle relaxation, autogenic training, and so on. So all of these things, whilst at the end of the day have commonalities between them, the way we deliver it has to be personalized. This is the lifestyle medicine model of disease that was just sort of written into the textbooks back about six years ago by Professor Gary Egger here in Australia, who set up the Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And, and fundamentally, what we're talking about here is, you know, we identify syndromes and diagnostic labels like dementia and anxiety. But as we, as all of us know here, is that the, these, are, these are labels um, describing symptoms. The actual underlying disease process, there is overlap between them. Uh, and there is so much overlap between these things that labels at some point become a little bit useless or, or uh, frustrating. And so in lifestyle medicine, what we're really talking about is understand, uh, talking about the determinants of health and illness, whether they are distal determinants like social and or proximal determinants like lifestyle factors, and how does that influence the cellular and molecular mechanisms of mental illness and health and recovery? And so what are we tweaking here? And by understanding those mechanisms, which again, I will touch on very lightly, it allows us to 
justify lifestyle interventions as real interventions. They're not just sort of placebo, feel good, warm, cuddly things. They are actually real medicines and therefore deserve to be prescribed as and encouraged as real medicines. Now, in Australia, um, you know, after a, a bit of lobbying and a lot of papers, um, we in about two years ago, or now three now, it's 2024 now, um, got a sort of big change happen. I believe this is the first guideline in the world to, to the first psychiatric sort of college guideline in the world to really put lifestyle changes um, and formalize it right at the front of the guideline. So they, this is one of the um, images from the guideline and the quote from it is lifestyle changes and psychological interventions are foundational um, and essentially non-negotiable for all mood disorders. And so because of the evidence that had been collating over the four years before that, and like I said, a little bit of lobbying, um, they recognized that actually this is a real medicine now. It's not just a sort of optional little additional extra that we can throw on when we when we have the time, but actually we should really start reorientating mental health services to include these things. And uh, and that that has been the result of this sort of lifestyle psychiatry burst. So on the right here, you can see a meta review of lifestyle psychiatry, where this term really started to take off in 2020 and led by Joseph Firth, who was in Australia with us for a while, but is now back in the UK. And a lot of these names you may uh, recognise um, on the right there in the, in the journal point, Brendan Stubbs and Felice Jacker and Scott Teasdale and many others uh, being real leaders in this area. Um, a lot of them in Australia, I'm pleased to say, Brendan being in the UK. And then on the left here, uh, last year, beginning of last year, we, myself and Wolfgang Marx and a number of others there, you'll see from around the world, including America, James Blumenthal and, and others, Philippe in, in Brazil and so on, um, published this clinical guideline uh, to really formalise that lifestyle interventions um, with, you know, with a with a uh, respectable journal, as it were, can be considered a a real intervention. Um, now, I will go through this in a little bit more detail. It's a bit painful, but I will go through it nonetheless. The point about the lifestyle psychiatry is, is one that we recognise it improves mental health, but also how much it improves physical health, and that is no great surprise. But what may be more of a surprise, and this is uh, a lot of work that's been done with the Equally Well initiatives, is the the life expectancy gap between those with the average population of severe mental illness. It's about 10 up to 20 years between those with schizophrenia. And that's largely due to chronic preventable disease like cardiometabolic disease. And the studies have shown that about 80% of that is reversible or preventable, sorry. So why do we need these things? Well, I'm not, I'm guessing I'm talking to the preaching the converted to some degree here, but a hundred years ago, um, you know, the major diseases that we were dealt with were infections, uh, child mortality, operations mortality, uh, maternal mortality during childbirth and so on. And we've done really well over the last, medicine did what it was supposed to do. It came up with public health measures, sanitation, anesthetics, operate, better operations, antibiotics, vaccinations, and so on. So we met the challenges of the time. And what part of my mission, you could say, is to encourage us to, to um, not just rest on our laurels, but actually realize that there are new challenges that are in front of us now, which is chronic disease, chronic mental illness, chronic physical illness, and readdress and re-evolve uh, medicine as we have continually been doing as an iterative process that we now need to change the way we deliver medicine to address the current challenges, which is a shame. It would have been really nice if we dealt with the challenges 50, 60, 100 years ago, and that would have been it. it would have been stopped there. But sadly, that's not the way it's gone. And some of these diseases like type 2 diabetes, I know it's not a mental illness, are going up at alarming rates. In Australia, between 2000 and 2020, we had a tripling in the number of people with type 2 diabetes. This is a common trend around the world, worse in certain countries like Polynesia and Micronesia. Um, and we now have about 25% of Australians with prediabetes or diabetes. The stats in America are not dissimilar, and that is very likely underdiagnosed. Now, when it comes to mental illness, again, these are stats from UK, Australia, so apologies, but I'm sure they're very similar for, for um, America. As a GP, uh, mental health illnesses are now the number one sort of leading presentation that people present with. Because of the model as it's built, the model is based on a infection disease model or on a trauma-based model, whereas we're not on a chronic disease model and we need to evolve that. We respond as we're kind of forced to respond with a pharmaceutical approach, which of course, I'm not anti-pharmaceuticals by any mean. I prescribe them. I've got scripts right in front of me right here. So it's not that I'm against them. It's just that it's about having more tools in the toolbox. That's simply the point that we're making. 
And because of the model as it is, over 60% of people leave a GP appointment with a script for psychotropics, despite the fact that that may well not be the best thing for them from a in, from a evidence point of view, from a recovery point of view, and from a side effect point of view, because psychotropics, as we know, have significant side effects, and that can be very hard to get off. In stats around the world, so I'll show you here from New Zealand, um, over the sort of 10, 20 years before COVID, we saw a increase of about 65% in adolescents, including a doubling of the antipsychotic prescriptions in young people. In the UK, which is this table on the right, I'm not sure if my my image is in the way, my face is in the way there, but um, you can minimize all of that. Um, and you can see that for the 10 years before COVID, um, there was a doubling in the number of antidepressant prescriptions prescribed by in, in the United Kingdom, um, despite the fact that we're really making no difference to the overall rates. It's uh, similar rates in Australia and similar rates in other countries as well. So we've seen this sort of significant increase in um, our response to the psychological distress of our po populations is has been largely to respond with the doubling of antidepressant prescriptions. In Australia now, one in six Australians are antidepressants. We're actually the second highest in the OECD, which is frightening, quite frankly. And we don't have the excuse. Island, uh, sorry, Iceland at least has the excuse of seasonal affective disorder and no sunlight. We don't have that excuse in Australia. We have ample sunlight, um, so we have. We have um, a real challenge on our hands. And what that's meant is an enormous increase in burden just for mental health concerns on um, the entire healthcare sector. And that means a lot more money is being spent on psychotropics and dealing with the side effects to that and mental health admissions and psychologists. And despite all of that, we've actually made no difference. Despite the fact that we are pumping out antidepressants like they are Skittles, we have made no real difference to the rates. In fact, some of these stats, this is a paper that came out last year from the University of Melbourne, and they broke down mental health scores based on age. And on the left here, you can see the darker blue lines of the younger people and the fainter blue lines of the older people. And so in the older generations, their mental health seems to be fairly stable. But in the younger generations, we are seeing an absolute plummeting in the mental health um, of those younger generations for a number of reasons. Um, but for sure, lifestyle and social factors, screens, social media, any number of things that have fit into that. So my sort of message here is, as Lao Tzu said some thousands of years ago, um, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. And, and I'm pretty concerned about these statistics. So as part of the clinical guideline, we Spent a couple of years um, reviewing the literature here. We reviewed um, the mixed literature, you could say, so the literature around psychological distress. And then we had to narrow it down because the, I suppose the artificial nature of research is that we have to pick a um, population group, which we chose as major depression, given how common it is. But there were lots of papers on anxiety or psychological distress or dysthymia or other disorders, which we couldn't include because of the sort of very strict way of doing these systematic reviews and involving them. So I've decided to show you the evidence in a slightly different way. But we reviewed a good 10,000 papers here. We had a lot of meetings. We spoke to a lot of people. Um, and so certainly it was a lot of work. And this is the author list that was there. So first, we looked at the observational studies, observational prospective studies looking at this, and we saw that there were a lot. So there's a lot of studies. You know, we're looking at 50 studies of physical activity, smoking cessation, diet. So there was a lot of evidence in, in indicating to us from an epidemiological point of view that lifestyle factors had a huge impact on um, mental health. We then looked at intervention studies in mixed populations. Uh, meaning things like uh, mixed anxiety, depression, substance abuse, dysthymia, psychological distress, studies where they weren't very clear on, you know, who the actual, or they weren't as refined in their pop population. And again, we saw a lot of studies here. You can see here physical activity, 25 randomized control trials, smoking cessation, 12 randomized control trials, diet, 16 randomized control trials, sleep, um, 65 clinical trials. So actually a huge number of trials. Where the trials really fail, not fail, but where there's a massive gap in the literature is social connection. Interestingly, we all sort of intuitively understand how important social connection is, but yet there's been very little studies done on how do you actually improve social connection subjectively and objectively, um, and how do you personalize that? So that is a big gap in the literature, and we're getting, there are some studies now, and you know, I can talk about that later. 
And then when we talk about specifically people with depression, obviously the field starts to narrow now because we're now focusing on those. And we've now got, say, Take Diet, for example, we've got four randomized control trials looking two in adults, one in adolescents and one in older adults. Um, sleep, we've got one meta-analysis um, and so on and so forth. And then we're looking now at less, um, less quality evidence, say, for green space and so on. And so these are the recommendations that we came out with. And in truth, you know, so, so the, and in truth, some of our authors, including myself, were sort of not almost not that happy with these because we really wanted to see some grade A recommendations come through, especially for certain things which I which just seem so strong from the observational and uh, mixed populations like physical activity, for example. Really, that should be a grade A. And so I would like to add two more columns to this if I was permitted. One is a common sense recommendation, and that would be an A. And one is based on the entirety of the evidence not just on a specific disorder like uh, major depression disorder, which would also be an A. Nonetheless, we have to stick to the rules of the guidelines, and that is the way the system works. And I would throw that out as a slight challenge to, to the way we do guidelines and evidence um, to be a little bit less reductionist. But nonetheless, this is this is where we're at at the moment. Um, and, and that is based on their grading criteria where it sits. However, it's not to sort of underplay how... Um, how much evidence there is in its entirety. And as you'll see here, uh, most of them are grade B, which is, I think, a very high level of evidence. Uh, loneliness, as I said, is, is the lowest because there just is very little evidence there. Now, a little bit of detail. And uh, I've got about 25 minutes or so, so I'm going to try and skim through this quite quickly. In, in particular, just to highlight a few points. Now, the, I've just highlighted a few of the studies, which, and there's lots of others that I could have chosen, um, partly just to highlight a few points. So I'm going to stick with the mind-body to start with, relaxation training being a, uh, one. This was a meta-analysis published quite a while ago, but it's such a, uh, a, it had some good learnings and lessons from it, partly a, to highlight the importance of the repetitive nature of a lot of this sort of stuff like that we the more we do it the better we get at it it's just like i explained to my patients if i ask you to go to the gym now and bench press 40 kilos or 80 kilos you probably couldn't do it but if you train every day then you'll be able to do it it's the same with the mind body practices it's regular practice if we look at it from a statistical analysis or effect size point of view that's where the cohen's d comes in now, Cohen's D is a size, a measure of effect size. So zero compared to control means no difference. So there's no real effect. 0.2 means mild, 0.5 means medium, and 0.8 means large. And to put it into context, antidepressants have on average a Cohen's D of about 0.3, give or take. 0.35, it's more effective for severe depression and less effective for mild to moderate depression. But 0 0.3, 0 0.35 on average. So you see here the relaxation training for anxiety disorders um, and there are mindfulness-based treatments as well, which I just didn't include for this presentation, but but I could have. Um, a, a, a quite high, Cohen's D.57. And if we understand why that is, then it makes a lot of sense. Now, I could go through this detail a lot. In, in, I could spend a whole hour on this slide alone, but simply to highlight the point that chronic biological, psychological, and social distress have these impacts on the brain that we are now truly really understanding how it is relevant to anxiety and depression. And we, there, and we identified that these lifestyle factors, which, which address this biopsychosocial distress, does reverse and improve these central nervous system changes, and not just central nervous system, the microbiome and other aspects, which I'll touch on with the diet. One area in particular that I like to explain to patients is around the microglia. And the microglia make up about 15% of our brain cells. There are our immune cells, they're derivatives of macrophages in our brain, and their job is to essentially clean the brain, clean the synapse. Um, remove the amyloid plaques and the other sort of plaques that build up during the day and the damage that occurs. In a chronically inflammatory lifestyle social um, background, these microglia switch to a pro-inflammatory phenotype. And that obviously begets, therefore, various other symptoms. And, and this paper here really highlighted the impact of this you know, metabolic syndrome, obesity, chronic stress, which you can see at the bottom here, the dysbiosis and so on, the fancy sort of inflammasome and cascades that occur there, the impact on the microglia, and then the impact on the synapse itself, leading to a reduction in neurotransmitters and leading, and leading to a lot of these symptoms. So again, just highlighting that we're really understanding the mechanisms here. One of the programs we did in our hospital um, was what was called a PRN pilot. And um, we had, uh, in I assume you use the same terminology over there with PRN, but PRN means as needed medications. And, and as you would know, people in, in hospital often come along various 
acute uh, distress or crisis for whatever reason. Um, and they will present with requiring medication, usually some sort of sedative and antipsychotic. And about 80% of the time, the studies show that they are provided a sedative and antipsychotic. We set up a program where they had a choice. They could always have medication. We would never deny them medication if they needed it, but we would offer them instead to go into our room here, our sensory room, either do guided meditations or yoga or stretches or things like that that would be guided via an audio guiding or a video on the TV or something like that. And we actually found that about 70% of patients would prefer to do this than have medication. And it, what it did, it not only did this significantly reduce the amount of medication that we were dispensing, which is good because we're not creating dependence and side effects, but it actually led to the whole point of all of this, which is recovery. People learn how to respond to and have a better relationship with their emotional states through the actions of their way of life, which is fundamentally the goal. Now, movement, I don't really need to say because the evidence is so strong, as I've already highlighted, but we know it's as effective as antidepressants and psychotherapy. We know it's effective for depression, anxiety, and evidence is emerging for schizophrenia as well. This massive study that was done last year in Adelaide and in uh, Australia, it was an, a, a sort of an overview of systematic reviews. We love to, we used to think systematic reviews was the gold level of evidence, and now we're doing systematic reviews of systematic reviews. So we've really like, <laughs> We can't help ourselves. Um, but this showed that the Cohen's D here was about 0.43, as I said, compared to uh, pharmacotherapy at about 0 0.3, 0 0.35. So now that th this is not a fair comparison because um, of varying statistical reasons, but all the same, it just goes to show that this is a an intervention that deserves to be on the map. And I'd love to go again through this slide in an hour, and I can't, but simply to say that exercise improves Pretty much every single biological process in the body, exercise improves it, whether it's peripheral, whether it's cardiovascular, whether it's mitochondrial, whether it's uh, microbiome, whether it's synaptogenesis, it's good for everything. And the endocannabinoid system we're learning a lot more about too. This is the first trial many of you would have come across, potentially the SMILES trial done here in, um, in uh, Victoria, in Australia, looking at diet, mod modified Mediterranean diet, so predominantly whole food, plant-based diet, um, with a little bit of fish, chicken, et cetera, um, showing that um, those who had a, those with moderate to severe depression who went who had a modified Mediterranean diet, a third of those went into remission versus 8% in control. This has now been repeat, repeated three more times. And as I said, in mixed populations, which is the bottom here, the meta-analysis of RCTs confirms that. Why? Well, again, it, we're not just providing the substrates that we need for our body, the vitamins and the minerals, the omega-3s and so on, that our body needs to actually do its processes, aka convert tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin and so on. Um, but we also, for all the other biological processes, the mitochondria need all these antioxidants and vitamin Bs and so on to operate so that they can run the neurons so that we can process information, so that they can run the immune system so that we can clean, clean up inflammation, we can reduce oxidative stress. To, so we can make the hormones. The gut microbiome, enormously important. I'd love to touch on it, but can't. The tryptophan kynurenine pathway, again, super important. If we have, if we are providing our body with the right signals, then we will go ahead and make what we need to make out of our uh, neurotransmitters. But if we don't, then we go on to make neurotoxic metabolites instead. This is a food program. That this is pre me pre-beard some years ago with a psychiatrist, Dr. Linda Barron, where we would we were running uh, essentially culinary nutrition programs within the ward itself and getting people to cook with the staff and the staff and the patients all have a once a week lunch together and there are many elements to this partly again it's about recovery it's about teaching it's about eating well it's about um, hands-on experiential learning as opposed to theoretical didactic learning but it was also about community building and changing the culture within the service which if I could hand on any any wisdom for what it's worth it is about changing the culture of our services makes a huge difference. I highlight sleep because it's a, a core pillar. Um, so it's just started raining and we have pretty significant tropical storms here where I live. So apologies if it gets quite noisy. Um, but um, sleep disorders are so common in people with psychiatric illness, we essentially must screen for them. And they are a very common cause of treatment resistance. I've had many patients with severe depression or even psychotic disorders who've been resistant to clozapine and all other kinds of things, and then you treat their severe sleep apnea and then things change exponentially. 
Um, this is a meta-analysis of randomized control trials looking at non-pharmacological sleep interventions um, on depression symptoms, and this was a mixed population. So again, it was couldn't really be included um, as strongly in our guideline because it was a mixed population, which is a shame, but it's a fantastic study nonetheless. And they showed that these um, various sort of paradoxical thinking and sleep restriction therapy and so on had an impact on depression symptoms. Now, this, this was such a big effect that I must admit I am slightly skeptical um, that it's this positive, but nonetheless, um, this is still a great, um, a great outcome. Now, I will say, again, I assume this is happening in America. Uh, it's certainly happening in Australia. One in four Australians are lonely. Uh, it's much higher in elderly people, in young people, in people with chronic disease, in people with mental illness. It's up to one in two. We know that loneliness increases your risk of um, all-cause mortality, even cancer-specific mortality, um, in at, uh, by about 30%, which is about as much as a pack of smokes a day. Um, so I sort of encourage everyone to seriously consider just making sure, asking if your patients how they feel in regards to their social support, connection, and loneliness, just make it a core part of your assessment. I mean, I so many patients come in to see me with depression, anxiety, whatever it is, and when we get down to the root of it, they are deeply lonely and they're struggling with that alone. And if they had a support, th th things would change. I'm not going to go through the mechanisms of there. But this, this study was done in 2020, which was a what's called a Mendelian randomization study. So it's a way of combining epidemiological data with some genetic data and other things to look at how we can derive causation from epidemiological data, which is a new, a new thing. And what they looked at was all the modifiable factors for the prevention of depression. And they said the number one factor um, for protecting against depression was trusted social connection. So again, it just highlights the absolute crucialness, the crucial nature of us assessing and involving this. I can see little things coming from chat, but I'm not looking at them and I will at the Q&A. One of the questions that um, comes up always is which comes first? Does people being depressed lead to loneliness or does loneliness lead to depression? And of course it's both, of course it's bi-directional, but a study in New Zealand looked at this about five years ago and they found that actually social connectedness was found to be a stronger predictor of mental health, aka loneliness was more likely, was a stronger predictor of depression than the inverse. Now, social media is a big one. I think we can all recognize how big this is and how we're, this is a um, generational and cultural struggle. Um, and I think my, my hope is with time, we learn as humans to become more mature with our use of social media, but we shall see. This, this study here, meta-analysis, was the first study done to really look at all of the different aspects of social media use and mental health. And it showed that um, the depression, the associated with depression symptoms and problematic social media use was, um, was moderate in its strength. So there's clearly a average trend that social media leads to depression on average. Now, of course, there's nuance here. There are good things about social media too. And the problematic social media use means, are we checking it first thing in the morning? Are we checking it on the toilet? You know, are we checking it instead of attending to our life activities? Are we being interrupted by it? And I think if most of us are going to be honest, most of us would struggle with some of that to some degree. Now, nature, there's not a lot of money to be made in nature. So the studies here are just not very strong. There's not a lot of randomized control trials here. But the few studies that we have, again, show the same thing. The more time we spend in nature, the better for our self-esteem, the better for our mood. This was an health economic study done um, and showed in in, in uh, UK. For every pound invested in people going into nature, we got seven pounds roughly in return on investment because of their well-being, return to work, and so on. Smoking, I bring up because we all know smoking is bad, um, but there's been a sort of idea, partly based on experience, that when people quit smoking with mental illness, they get worse. And that's true in the sense that they feel crap for the first month. Most people who quit smoking feel pretty average for the first month or two. But the longer term data, the sort of six to 12 month data, is actually that their mental health improves as much as if they were to start an antidepressant therapy. So that reducing those anti-inflammatory, those in, sorry, reducing those inflammatory compounds in the body is impressive. The same is true. Systematic reviews have also, uh, this is an old slide, apologies, I didn't update. There's actually a 2023 systematic review on this now. And I think a 2021 one on alcohol um, showing the same results. And on top of that, probably the biggest carrot to dangle for patients 
um, is the fact that smoking increases the cytochrome, which is the liver enzyme metabolism of medication. So when we quit smoking, certain medications are not metabolized anymore. And therefore, certain medications like olanzapine, clozapine, um, fluoxetine, can, you can reduce the dose of those by up to 50% in many patients once they stop smoking, purely because so much more of that medication is now getting into their system. So that can be a really good carrot to dangle. And of course, all of this is good for physical health as well. I don't really need to talk about that. We know that the majority of chronic disease is preventable. We've known this for some time. Um, we've also known for some time, thanks to the work of people like Dr. Dean Ornish and other people uh, in America, that these chronic lifestyle related diseases like coronary artery disease, like type two diabetes is also reversible with the same lifestyle measures. So we are having one or a series of interventions improving every domain of a person. So that's this is um, coronary artery disease on reversal. Whoops, I'm sorry, I've lost my slides here. This is type, this is one of my patients. And I don't think you, you I don't know which one you use in America, percentages or millimoles or none of those for HbA1cs. But you can see here, my patient came in with a HbA1c of 11 with type 2 diabetes. And within three months, I got them down to 6.1. I stopped their medications. And they were down to 5.8. So we can reverse disease. There is no reason we should be accepting chronic disease um, and just assuming that it's a lifelong thing that requires medication management. Yes, medication has its role. I'll say that again. And one thing that many people probably don't appreciate is this is the risk factors for suicide. And actually, physical health, chronic physical health disorders are the leading risk factor for suicide, and mood disorders are the second. So if we have a lifestyle interventions that improve both of those, we are also significantly addressing suicide risk. So all of this adds up. Not to be um, idealistic about it or naive about it. Of course, there are challenges implementation. Of course, the reality is that not everyone adopts these things, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't accept, I don't accept those in, as an excuse to not try because the same analogy could be made for smoking cessation. We know that with the best nicotine replacement therapy and bupropion or Champix or whatever you're using and psychological support, we can take a average annual smoking cessation rate from say 3% with no support to 25% with the best support. I use that as analogous that, that to lifestyle interventions in the sense that just because not 100% of people quit smoking, does that mean we don't even bother? Of course we try because we know that we're going to make a huge difference to a lot of people. It's the same with lifestyle interventions, though I would argue it's a lot better than 25%. So now in the last 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to touch on models of care, because the reality is, as I said, we don't really do this. And the point of this picture is to say, do we need new models? Yes, a drill press is very effective. Yes, pharmaceuticals is very effective. Surgery is very effective. But sometimes it just gets a little bit silly to try and use a drill press for a small job. And it's kind of the same analogy. We just need to add tools to our toolbox. And that's what I'm suggesting. So this picture came from um, the guideline that we published, really to encourage us to zoom out and think about uh, the way we deliver health from um, more holistically. So we have our clinical care, our one-to-one -one clinical care. And that means embedding lifestyle interventions into that clinical care, as well as our um, the way we communicate, our health coaching, behavior change, terminology and techniques. But then to zoom out even further and think about the models of care and the implementation considerations, how do we work more effectively with disciplines? How do we work more effectively with peer support? How do we embed behavior change science into the environment? How do we use digital technology? And then how do we address those social determinants from a micro level? And by micro level, I mean community levels, schools, workplaces. And then, of course, at a policy level, but most of us have very little impact on policy. This is what we call the reverse Swiss cheese model, which we also published. And, and I'm a little bit proud of this because this was one of my babies, or both, both of these were. Um, and the point was simply to, again, just to conceptually encourage us to think about that with lifestyle medicine, it's not a single intervention. We are, we are building in layers into a person's life so that, as, so that we can capture and improve and prevent um, their well-being or prevent illness and capturing that early and encouraging well-being a lot sooner. If we, the more layers we have built, both from an individual point of view, from a, but from also from a health service point of view, the better we're going to have outcomes. Acknowledging that no one layer is perfect, and that's an important point.
um, because that's probably where some of the criticism comes from. Now, we do need to fundamentally change education here. There's been systematic reviews showing that have looked at med school curriculums all around the world, um, showing that it's essentially inadequate in every curriculum around the world. That's in specialty training as well as medical school. And that's, again, it sounds critical. I suppose it is critical, but it's not meant to be. We have a lot that we need to learn in med school. Um, but it's simply to say that we also need to be a little bit humble and accept we don't know what we may not know. And actually, there may be a lot more evidence here um, than we than we originally were thought. I highlight this little slide just to simply say that industry, inverted commas, has been using behavior change science to make us buy things and want things that we haven't and don't really want and don't really want to buy. It's time to use this behavior change science, aka health coaching, for the betterment of our patients. And this area is, as you can see, is sort of exponentially taking off in the last 10 to 15 years and how we actually help people change their behaviors in a ethical way. And that includes the built environment, as I said. How do we design waiting rooms? How do we design services? How do we use um, incentives and cues and nudging to, um, to better people's outcomes? And this is something we used a lot on the mental health wards, on the inpatient wards. We change the waiting rooms, we change the layouts, we change the rooms themselves, we change the um, common areas, et cetera, et cetera. And I I'm just gonna quickly go through this simply to say that whether it's tertiary hospital or primary care or community care, lifestyle interventions can be built in at every level. There is an opportunity at every point of contact within between us and the patients. This is one of the major programs that was led in uh, first episode psychosis in New South Wales and Australia, which is one of the, really one of the first trials or programs done in the world. A lifestyle medicine program for those who came in with first episode psychosis who were admitted for it. We saw that with this lifestyle medicine program, we were able to attenuate the weight gain, which we know is a massive problem with antipsychotics, but we were able to, in, in a lot of patients, negate it completely. And in some patients reduce it by sort of in, in every other patient reduce it by some degree of percentage reduce smoking improved diet quality and reduction of discretionary food and most patients would recommend the program so huge satisfaction this program was then expanded um, to keeping the staff in mind because one of the major barriers that was i've seen and this this cohort saw was actually the culture was a little bit anti lifestyle. See, it's not my job to do lifestyle. It's not my job to address this stuff, or there's no evidence for this stuff. There's no point. So we ran well-being programs for the staff, and that changed the culture because people then started having experience, experiences that actually this really improves my well-being and my mind and my body state. I can see now why it would be relevant to my patients. This is a study done in UK led by Matt War, a nurse over there in the psychiatric intensive care units. Again, a lifestyle medicine program. And one of my favorite parts here was that they had open feedback displayed in common areas. And here they saw a 43% reduction in the violent incidents in the ward and very high positive feedback from staff and users. And he's now rolling out um, safe gyms. So obviously in a psychiatric intensive care unit, you're not gonna provide a gym with weights because they might hurt themselves or someone. So there's a lot of adaptations here. You would use light weights or bags and things of that nature. Um, so he's now consulting a number of other psychiatric units on how to build gyms that are appropriate for the needs of that population. Shared medical appointments is something that's really taken off in America, but certainly around the world. There's hundreds of publications now, and we're doing these a lot more in patients. Um, we're showing better outcomes, better satisfaction. Instead of me seeing one person uh, with depression or anxiety at, at a time and spending 10 to 15 minutes with them, why don't I see six to nine people and spend an hour and a half and they can all learn from each other in a peer support facilitated professional way. We've applied this group methodology to Aboriginal people and I know that's, we, we have Aboriginals here, you have your First Nations people in America and uh, I can't speak for America but I can certainly speak for here that this group based approach is far more culturally appropriate and we are seeing uh, we are seeing much, much better results and engagement with these new models of care to the point where we see increasing numbers over time of people attend, which is unheard of in one to one traditional, let's say, whatever you want to call it, Western or modern sort of medicine, traditional care. Some of the major paradigm shifts in primary care has been to expand the workforce um, and 
Some of this has been led by Patty Robinson, who you may be aware of in America. She's uh, done a lot of work on behavior change consultants, done a lot of work with the Department of uh, Defense and other aspects. And, and we and in New Zealand, she, we brought her over and to train um, a sort of new workforce um, in primary care, which is sort of health coaches, health well-being practitioners, social prescribers that have been added into mental health. In um, New Zealand, there are now 450 practices who have this model, uh, and they are seeing huge benefits, improvements in symptoms of physical and mental health, improvement in access. 90% of people are being seen within five days now, very high levels of satisfaction and redu reduction in psychotropic prescribing. Similar models in UK, where they're bringing in um, volunteers and community people and peer support workers into primary care, because they recognize that about 40% of what they do is psychosocial and is, is not biomedical necessarily, or though it has biomedical consequences. Um, but how can we, if, if so much of mental distress is because of psychosocial determinants, how can we um, expand our workforce to accommodate that? And I'm happy to talk about that in more detail, but I just won't now. This is the Primrose study, which was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, just to make a point that about this expanded workforce um, that in this study was really about cardiovascular disease prevention. So they were looking at mental health, but it wasn't actually the primary aim of the study, but it, they found some interesting things with when they actually have nurses provide what is essentially lifestyle medicine, along with adherence to medications, which is health coaching, because health coaching is not just about adhering to a diet, but really adhering to any recommendation, AKA medication. What they saw is a, a significant drop, 27% with the number of ad admissions. So that's a 63% or 73% drop um, and reduction in admissions for physical health and a significant reduction, almost a 40% reduction in the cost per um, person because of this more holistic approach to mental and physical health. And this is in people with severe mental illness, I, sh I should have said, sorry. So um, this is not in the average population. This is a what people would classify as a difficult uh, to change population. But you can see here how much of a difference it made. And simply to say that there are many exciting ways that are emerging now. We can see that by using social media groups, by doing these sort of community-based classes, by using group-based programs, we're seeing completely different improvements on chronic disease management more broadly. I'd love to talk about rites of passage in Adelaide health, adolescent health, but I can't because I'm over time. That's a beautiful video about rite of passages and mental health in Aboriginal people, if you're so interested in searching on YouTube. And then the digital program. So I will say this because this is relevant to America. You may have heard of Professor Darren Morton here from Australia. He's done a lot on positive psychology and he's got the LIFT program. And that's been shown in multiple randomized control trials now in various population groups um, to improve depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms. And what I love about Darren's work is he focuses on increasing vitality because it's so we so often focus on reducing negative symptoms, but so rarely focus on improving positive symptoms. And he's shown that we can actually you get both. And for though this is nothing to do with mental health, but I just make sure everyone's aware that if you've got patients with cardiovascular disease, um, that Dean Ornish program is now online, which is amazing. That happened quite recently. Um, and the most common question I get is, okay, great, thanks, Sam, but what do I do now? And I would just take them to the Rogers Diffusion of Innovation Curve, which is how do we create change in a system? And we don't have to get 51% or 60% of people to change to create systemic change. We actually only need about 18 to 20% of the cohort to change before that then begets the early majority kicks in and then people, people just take it on board because it's now a norm. And so I encourage you just to connect, identify the people on this group today, the other people who you can connect with who are the innovators and the early adopters, strengthen each other, support each other, build your programs, you know, build it and they will come, as they say. And um, that's certainly been my experience in a lot of the work I've done. We've met resistance for various reasons, um, but we find our 20% who are the innovators and the early adopters. We make the programs, we make the change, and then eventually after a year or two, pretty much everyone is on board. And if you're interested, this is my last slide, thank you for your patience, um, is we've just released this three-week micro certificate on Future Learn. It's an online training program for lifestyle medicine and mental health services. So the first week is kind of what I've covered today. Second week is on communication skills, how to adjust psychotropic medications and 
using metformin and other things to offset some of those medication side effects. And then the third week is about implementation. So how do we implement services and some case studies? So Matt War, the nurse I mentioned is in there, the Keeping Body and Mind program, Simon Rosenbaum and others have done a video for us and they present on how they actually delivered these programs um, and did it. So we're still in early days fundamentally. I think that's it, yep. Um, so we're still, I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen, in early days in truth, and I don't want to make it sound like it's better than it really is, but I will say that there's a lot of hope. <clears throat> there's a lot of good evidence already, and the response from the population is enormous. Now, I'm going to just mute and go close my window because it's getting really loud out there, so I'll be two seconds. Okay, Sam, I, you can still hear us, I hope, but um, thank you so much for this presentation. This is a phenomenal, and I think for this group, I just want to re-, re are, were you done, Sam? Or did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, okay. So I wanted to just give you a little orientation of this group. And I wanted, uh, really, Dr. Viz is uh, our president-elect is here of the American Psychiatric Association. So going to let him speak for a few minutes. But I wanted just to let you know that this Lifestyle Medicine Caucus, Lifestyle Psychiatry Caucus for the American Psychiatric Association, as we've discussed before, is new. So this is our fourth month, uh, and we're really excited about learning from what you've done in Australia and being able to learn from you and, and implement some of these in, and really create our 20% right here of, of the people that are that are interested and that are going to learn and, do, and move this forward. Many people in the room don't even know about the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So, you know, in, in orienting them to what's available, but also um, helping them as psychiatrists understand that what we have to offer is in concert with the physical aspects, right? That that it is together. And, and having you as a general practitioner bring this information forward is very helpful for everyone in the room. Dr. Viz, uh, are you available to talk right now? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Th thank you, Dr. Merlo, for organizing this important presentation and keep the momentum going. And uh, thank you, Dr. Manger, for uh, uh, conveying, you know, this great uh, work, you know, being uh, done in uh, Australasia. And uh, I'm the president-elect of the American Psychiatric Association. I will become a president in May of uh, this year. And uh, I'll have, my term will be one year. And my annual meeting uh, will be in Los Angeles in May of uh, 2025. Uh, guess what? You know, like every president chooses a theme uh, for his or her presidency. And the theme I have chosen is a lifestyle for positive uh, mental and physical health. And, uh, yeah, so, so this talk is uh, very timely. And as you uh, said you know, in the last slide, uh, you know, uh, what we are doing, you know, uh, GIA forming the caucus and my having this team, you know, it's a kind of in the early period. And we hope with this, you know, enough people get mobilized. And also there's an interconnection with the Climate Psychiatry Alliance. Uh, you know, like uh, there's a lot of uh, common interests. And so we, you know, hope to uh, create in enough awareness among our uh, uh, healthcare, you know, uh, professionals as well as the community, uh, because uh, this is quite important both for mental and uh, uh, physical health, uh, you know, both for us uh, as clinicians, as well as the people who we take care of. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Viz.